السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. So alhamdulillah, last week we started um, our series on uh, talking about Tawheed and details. And we had just mentioned the three categories of Tawheed. We talked about uh, why it's so important and this is the basic fundamental of Islam. This is step number one. Without it, there is no paradise. And we also looked at the opposite, which is shirk. And we mentioned how severe this is and this is the worst sin. So moving on, uh, going back to, and we had mentioned also the example of Ibrahim alayhi salam. We mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described him with certain characteristics. So um, following on today, we'll start again with mentioning something about Ibrahim alayhi salam before we continue. The Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says regarding Ibrahim that Father كَانَتْ لَكُمْ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا that indeed, uswatun hasanatun fi Ibrahim walladina ma'ahu. Indeed, there is a great example for you in Ibrahim alayhi salam and those who are with him, those who are upon the same religion as Ibrahim alayhi salam. You have a great example. If qalu li qawmihim inna bura'a minkum wa mimma ta'buduna min dunillah. And then Allah describes what did Ibrahim alayhi salam do. So, when Ibrahim salam said to his people that verily, for sure, indeed, certainly, I am free, him and his people, those who believed in Ibrahim salam, that we are free from that which you worship, these other things that you worship besides Allah, these other things that you call on besides Allah, we are free from it. We have nothing to do with you and your religion. Uh, uh, kids who are running around, sit down inshallah. Uh, so we have nothing to do with you and your beliefs, you committing shirk, so on and so forth. Kafarna bikum. We reject, we deny, we disbelieve in what you're doing. And wabada baynana wa baynakum al adawatu wal baghda abadan. And between us and you, ahlu tawheed and ahlu shirk, between us and you, there is enmity and hatred. Forever. Hatta tu'minu billahi wahda. Until you believe in Allah alone. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts this ayah by saying that Ibrahim is a great example for you. Then Allah tells us what exactly Ibrahim alayhi salam did. And this is exactly how you and I have to be. That there is Ahlul Tawheed and then there is Ahlul Shirk. Between us and them, there is enmity forever. The only reason, it's not personal, it has nothing to do with family, personal, tribal, national. It's because you worship others besides Allah. So this wall between us and you, this enmity, this hatred, will always be there until hatta tu'minu billahi wahda, until you believe in Allah alone. So there are, as I mentioned last week, that we can give so many ayat. The point is, this is the absolute first thing that a Muslim has to believe in and know. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was crystal clear throughout the Qur'an. There's no room for doubt, no room for confusion, no room for misinformation. No one can come on Yawm Al-Qiyamah and say, you know, I was Muslim for 50 years, but I didn't know what Tawheed was properly. This is not an excuse. Allah will never accept this from anyone. Alright, so he makes it very clear uh, in details, Tawheed and Shirk. So now a question that can come, what came first? Did Tawheed come first or did Shirk come first? The, the answer is, Tawheed was there first. And there's three evidences for this. Evidence number one, the Fitrah. Fitrah in Arabic means the innate nature with which the human being was created. The innate nature. And this is why, regardless of if someone is an atheist, or Christian, or Jew, or Buddhist, or Hindu, all of Bani Adam, they know murdering someone, killing someone is wrong. They know theft is wrong. They know a married person committing zina is wrong. Morally, it's wrong. These moral values, regardless of what religion someone comes from, 
these moral values are agreed upon by all people because that is the fitrah with which Allah created all of Bani Adam. We can't run away from it, right? So the majority of human beings know what is immoral and what's moral. And from this, the number one aspect of the fitrah is to recognize one creator. This is part of the fitrah. This is the innate nature of man. And how do we know this? Allah Himself tells us that after creating Adam alayhi salam, He says in Surah Araf, that وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ On that day, this is even before uh, you know, Adam alayhi was sent down to this dunya. After Allah created Adam alayhi from his loins, he brought out all the offsprings of Adam from that day until Yom al Because Allah knows Adam is going to sin, he's going to be thrown into the dunya, his children will live in the dunya until the day of resurrection. So Allah brought all of us out. Each and every one of us, we were present at that time. And Allah asked every human being one question, Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? Am I not your Rabb? And everybody, qalu bala shahidina. Every single human being said, yes, we certainly testify, you are the one Lord. An taqulu yawm al qiyamati inna kunna an hadha, an hadha ghafilin. Lest you come on the day of judgment and say, we have no idea what you're talking about. You cannot say that. And this is why, brothers and sisters, especially the young brothers and sisters, you will never see an atheist, I mean, he'll, he'll say that I, I don't believe in God, but in his actions, in his words, he cannot deny it, because it's in the innate nature of man. Like people say that they're atheists, but then they make these concepts like mother nature, right? Why do you believe in a superior being? Because it's impossible for a human being to say that there is no higher authority. It's impossible because of this incident that Allah made, uh, Allah took from us, this ahad, this covenant that Allah took from every one of us. So, and then also a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَا مِن مَوْلُودٍ إِلَّا يُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ There is not a single child that is born except that it is upon fitrah. It's already a Muslim. Every child that comes into life is upon the fitrah, which is the innate nature, upon tawheed. But his parents make him a Jew or a Christian or a fire worshiper. Or <laughs> in Muslim families, a grave worshiper and this and that, right? But nobody comes out born as a mushrik. Everyone, every human being is born upon the fitrah, upon tawheed. And this is in contrast to what the Christians believe, right? Everybody's born with the original sin. You have to be baptized because you're born with sin. Like this shows that God is unjust. What sin did a child commit? Why is a child being punished for what the father did? This doesn't make any sense, right? So obviously this is not from Islam. But every child is a born upon Islam, upon the fitrah of Tawheed, of knowing one Lord. Right? Even if you take a Christian child who just learned how to talk, three years old, four years old, whatever may be the case, ask him. Like every, all that you see, do you think it came from somewhere? Yes. They could get. Now can you explain the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit? He's not going to know what this is. But a child will know Tawheed. He'll clearly understand one Allah all this came from Allah, everybody came from Allah. This is very clear and very simple. So this is why the Prophet ﷺ said, everyone is born upon the fitrah, which is tawheed. Then also, the second evidence, we know that the people of Nuh, Nuh ﷺ was the first Rasul. The first Rasul sent to people was Nuh ﷺ. And during the time of Nuh is the first time shirk existed. And I had given a khutbah before Ramadan on this. Uh, this was the first time ever. There was no shirk in the history of humanity until Nuh alayhi salam. That's why he sent a Rasul. There was no need. He's the first messenger. And as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam mentioned in the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, or Abdullah ibn Abbas rather, that there was ten generations between Adam and Nuh. So for ten entire generations, not a single human being committed shirk. The first time they fell into shirk, Allah sent the first messenger. 
So this is evidence number two that Tawheed was always number one. And then of course the third and the biggest evidence our father Adam salam, who did he worship? Did he make sajda to a rock, a stone, the earth, the sun? No, he made sujood to Allah. He made salah to Allah. He didn't go to a grave. He didn't hang things around his neck, nothing. He called on Allah directly. So the father of mankind was on Tawheed. We have two other evidences. So we know clearly that Tawheed is the first thing. Then people became corrupted. Shaitan corrupted people and then brought shirk. But Tawheed is the original religion. The first religion is Islam. And this is the only religion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because sometimes you find, you know, sometimes you'll meet some Hindus who think they're very smart, right? No, you know, Hinduism is such an ancient religion. Idol worshipping is the right thing. <laughs> no, go back even more. You know, go back to your father, Adam alayhi salam. He was an idol worshipper, right? So anyway, so we know clearly that Tawheed came first. Tawheed was always there first. Then Shaitan came, corrupted, corrupted people and brought them into shirk. And we're still fighting that battle uh, of between Tawheed and shirk, right? And again, why is it important that we should learn about shirk? We mentioned this is the only unforgivable sin, the worst sin. Uh, this is what makes paradise haram for someone if he dies as a mushrik. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it very clear in the Qur'an that وَكَذَلِكَ نُفَصِّلُ الْآيَاتِ وَلِتَسْتَبِينَ سَبِيلُ الْمُجْرِمِينَ And likewise we make our ayat very clear. The message of the Qur'an is very clear. Why? So that who is the mujrim, who is the criminal becomes very clear. Who are the good people and who are the mujrimun. There is no doubt between the good person and the evil person. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarified all these things in details so that no one will ever be confused. Now we said that Tawheed is of three categories. Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, Uluhiyyah, and Asma wa Sifat. So let's first look at Tawheed al-Rububiyyah as the first one. We said that Allah is the one Lord. Allah is the one creator, the sustainer, the provider, the maintainer. All right, the owner of everything. How does someone fall into shirk when it comes to Tawheed al-Rububiyyah? His lordship that he is the Rabb. How does this happen? It happens in two ways. Either someone denies or someone associates. So let's give examples of both so it's clear. The first is that shirk in denial. That someone falls into shirk by denying that Allah is the only Rabb. And how does this happen? Like Fir'aun. The classic example is Fir'aun. Allah says about Fir'aun that قَالَ فِرْعَوْنُ وَمَا رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ He told Musa, what's Rabbul Alameen? What are you talking about? I am the Lord. This is what Fir'aun told Musa, I'm the Lord. So what Lord are you talking about? So there are people who will completely deny that there is a God, which is the atheists. And then also, as we mentioned, the Zoroastrians, the fire worshippers, the ancient Persian religion, and there are still people like that. They believe in two gods, two lords. God, the Lord of good and the Lord of evil. So this is again shirk in denial. They deny that there is only one Lord. And also they deny the perfect existence or the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, that they deny that Allah is the most forgiving, the most merciful, uh, so on and so forth. They'll deny all the attributes of Allah. If you deny someone's attributes, it means you're denying him. Because how can attributes exist without the actual being? So um, this is what the Greek philosophers were guilty of. Right? The Greek philosophers, they used to deny uh, Allah's attributes. They'd say that there's a being, but then they'll deny all the attributes of that being. So in reality, they're, they're denying the Lord. And also, uh, the third denial that people do, and unfortunately this exists among people who call themselves Muslims. They will deny that Allah, the, the, the perfection of His nature, that in essence, they believe that everything you see and the creation, the khaliq and the makhluk is the same thing. The concept is called wahdatul wujud. Right? This is kufr al-akbar. And there are people, even today, they believe in this, but then they call themselves Muslims. So the, what, the, what they'll say is, you see the sun, it's not the sun, it's Allah. 
So they think makhluk and Allah is the same thing. Right? So there is no understanding that the Lord is separate from His creation. No, wahdatul wujud. Everything is Allah and, ev- and Allah is everything. And this is what happens to the Christians and all those, you know, the people who believe in the, all the, the peer sahabs and all these things. Like if you ask a Christian, why, the Catholic especially, and things like this, why, are you, why do you think the priest can forgive you? No, God is in him. He's a holy man. God is inside him. And he is one with God. Right? So the same thing. Why do people go to these peers? No, no. He is one with Allah. He can forgive us. He can uh, make shafa, this, that, whatever it is. And also the Shia, the Ithna Asharia, which is the majority of the Shia, like about 85% of the world Shia population is Ithna Asharia, meaning the Twelvers. They believe that their 12 Imams have the same power as Allah. Okay, so this is the Kufr. They're, they're not Muslims. The Ithna Asharia are not Muslims. So people need to be aware of these things. Right? Look at the amount of Kufr that they have. They, that, like even the titles that they give to their Imams, they don't call them Shaykh or Imam, they say Ayatullah. He is the Ayah of Allah. What's the Ayah of Allah? The Quran. But this is the title the Shia give to their scholars, Ayatullah. He's not an ayah of Allah, what's wrong with you? He's just an imam or whatever it is. So this is what they believe. Or you look at Bashar, the leader of Syria, the Alawiya sect. He thinks he is Allah. This is what the Alawiya Shia, they believe. That their leader is the same with Allah. Him and Allah are the same. So that's why I said that unfortunately there are still millions of people who call themselves Muslims, but they are actually not Muslims. Because they are literally denying the existence of Allah, the uniqueness of Allah, that He is the Lord. Uh, An Imam is not Allah, or uh, this guy is not Allah. So this is what they believe, and of course this example of Wahdatul Wajud, which is another uh, uh, ideology, that everything is Allah, and Allah is everything. And the first person who started this, his name was Ibn al-Arabi. He's the first one who came up with this concept. Uh, but of course he was executed back then by the Khalifa because Islam was still protected. If someone came up with these crazy ideas, the government would take care of it. But nowadays, <laughs> the more corrupt you are, they put you on the news. They cheer you on, right? The more corrupt ideas you can come up. So this is one type of shirk and rububiyyah that they deny Allah's uniqueness, His attributes and give it, give it to His creation. The second way shirk and rububiyyah happens is by affirming Allah's Lordship with other people. So, like this is, the example would be of the Zoroastrians. That they say that there's a God of good, and then there's a God of evil. So they gave Allah's attributes to two made up beings. Right? So they affirm Allah's uh, attributes with uh, other things. And this would be the example, as I I went ahead of myself. (coughs) This would be the example of the Ithna Sharia. They, they, they believe in Allah, but they give Allah's attributes equally as uh, with their 12 Imams that they believe in. And uh, what's it called? Even, uh, you know, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, the first leader of Iran, he even wrote, because this is their belief, even has the uh, Al-Hukumat al Islamia. this is one of the books he had written. And he said that our belief, the Ithna Sharia belief is, that our imams, they have control over the uni- entire universe along with Allah. So they control the whole of creation along with Allah, meaning they help Allah run His creation. You know, I mean, astaghfirullah, this is like severe, severe shirk that you're saying Allah is weak. He needs a helper, and these helpers are helping Him uh, run the entire creation. So, of course, Tawheed al Rububiyyah, all of Tawheed al Rububiyyah. Uh, any type of shirk in Tawheed al rububiyyah is major shirk, right? Because we had mentioned the difference between major and minor shirk. When it comes to Tawheed al rububiyyah there is no minor shirk. Every shirk is major shirk because you're either denying or giving someone else Allah's lordship. He is the Rabb. He is Rabbul Alameen. You can't come and say someone else is also the Rabb. So this is major shirk. It takes someone uh, out of Islam. So now we come to the second category of Tawheed, which is where majority of the people fall into shirk, which is Tawheed al-Uluhiyya or Tawheed al-Ubudiyya, uh, two names. When it comes to doing ibadah 
that people associate partners with Allah in so many ways. And inshallah we'll give examples so that all of this is very clear. The very first and most common, which is what started with the people of Nuh, is exaggerating in the praise of pious people. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about the Christians and the Jews that Ya Ahl al Kitab, La Taghlu fi dinikum. O Ahl al Kitab, meaning the Jews and Christians, do not go into extremism in your religion. Wala taqulu ala Allahi illa al haq. And do not talk about Allah except that which is the truth. Don't lie about Allah with anything. Inna al Masih or Isa ibn Maryam, Rasulullahi wa kalimatuhu al qaha ila Maryam wa ruhum min. Indeed, Isa is the son of Mary. He is a spirit created by Allah and given to Mary. What is the lie that Ahlul Kitab did about Isa a.s.? The Christians, they said, he is Allah's son. Some Christians say he is Allah's son, he is Allah, him and Allah are the same, so on and so forth. Then the Jews completely denied him. The two extremes. But Allah says, stay in the middle path. Affirm, believe in Isa a.s. Don't say he's Allah's son. Don't call him Allah. Don't call him he's one in three. La taqulu thalatha. Don't say he is one of the three. All right, the Trinity as the Christians believe in. Don't say all this. But rather Isa alayhi salam is Allah's messenger. He was given a miraculous birth. But he's not Allah. He's a Rasul of Allah. So you follow the middle path. Uh, so wala taqulu thalatha intahu khairan lakum. So stop with this Trinity concept. This is what is best for you. إِنَّمَا الْإِلَاهُ إِلَاهُ wahid. Indeed, the ilah is only one ilah. Allah is one. سُبْحَانَهُ أَنْ يَكُونُ لَهُ وَلَدْ لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ وَكِيلًا Glory be to he, from having high, far high is he from having any child, uh, and to him belongs all that is in the heavens and the earth, and he does not need, he is all sufficient. He doesn't need any helpers to run anything. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ on his deathbed, as he was dying, uh, the fatal illness, those few days before his death, he was telling the Sahaba over and over again, summarizing this concept of Tawheed. This is what he first came with, and this is what he died with. In his deathbed, in that illness, he was telling the Sahaba that, لا تطروني كما أطرت النصارى نصارى ابن مريم Do not praise me like the Nasara, the Christians have praised Ibn Maryam. إِنَّمَا أَنَا عَبْدٌ Indeed, I am just a slave. فَقُولُوا عَبْدُ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ So call me the slave of Allah and His Messenger. Don't go to shirk. Because what did the Christians do? When they, when they need something, they're calling unto, Oh Jesus, give me this, give me that. Jesus is a holy man, no doubt. He was a very pious person. He's one of the best human beings ever. He's one of the top messengers. We know this. But they exaggerated in the praising of Isa alayhi salam. They fell into shirk. So he's reminding the Muslims, do not do the same thing with me like the Christians did with Isa alayhi salam. And again, unfortunately, there are millions of people. What do they do? They make dua to Rasulullah in our countries. So many people. Ya Rasulullah, I need help. Ya Rasulullah, my son is sick. They're making dua to Rasulullah instead of making dua to Allah. What is the difference between you and the Christian? No difference. Just as the Prophet ﷺ warned us in this hadith in Bukhari, don't do this. This is what the Christians were guilty of. They fell into shirk by elevating the status of Isa from a human being to becoming with Allah. Right? So this is obviously a clear prohibition. And also we have, like many people, they think, oh, the Prophet ﷺ, he is created from nur. Right? This is the, uh, he's created from light. We can worship, we can make dua to him. Where did you get this from? Allah says in the Qur'an, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ Allah is telling Muhammad ﷺ, tell the people, indeed I am just a human being like you. So if he's just a human being like you, how is he created from light? The malaika are created from light. Humans are created from the earth. So uh, definitely the Prophet ﷺ is not created from light. Or they'll say that the Prophet ﷺ is hadir wa nadir. Right? He was present all the time and he's everywhere. He can see everything. That's Allah. Allah is al-basir. 
Allah is a Samir. He can see everything, He can hear everything. Not the Prophet, right? So many people unfortunately, they go to this extreme and this is the shirk, it's a one type of shirk in uh, Tawheed al uluhiyah In another hadith, uh, as the Prophet ﷺ was on the lap of Aisha radiallahu anha, and this is how he died, on her lap. This is a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. Aisha said that he's going in and out. He, his, you can tell that he's about to die any moment. At that moment, she said, on my lap, Rasulullah said, لَعْنَةُ عَلَى الْيَهُودِ وَالنَّصَارِ Allah's curse is upon the Jews and Christians. Why? اتَّخَذُوا قُبُورَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِهِمْ مَسَاجِدٍ They took the graves of their prophets as masjid. Meaning those grave sites, this is where they make, they're worshipping. They're going to the graves of their prophets and making dua. They turned the grave sites into masjid. So this was one of the last words that came out of the Prophet's mouth. Emphasizing how important Tawheed is. And emphasizing how dangerous shirk is. That stay away. Don't do what the Jews and Christians did. Don't turn graveyards into masajid. Don't start worshipping the prophets. This is what the Christians and Jews did. And also we see uh, in another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ made it very clear. When Allah revealed the ayah, that وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ And go now, give the da'wah to those who are close to you. First it was secret. Then said, just to your close relatives. Then the third stage was now go out in public. Openly call to Islam. So it was in three stages. So when the Prophet ﷺ was given this ayah, that go call on your عَشِيرَتَكَ uh, الْأَقْرَبِينَ Your close family members. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said, that he climbed the Mount of Safa. Alright? He climbed. And then he said, Ya Ma'ashar al Quraysh. O Quraysh. He called on his whole tribe, his family. Ishtaru al Fusakum. Buy your own souls. Buy yourselves. Meaning, save yourselves in terms of the Akhirah. La uhni ankum min Allahi shay'a. Indeed, I cannot help you with Allah in any way whatsoever. You have to work for yourself. I can't help you. And then he called out, Ya Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, his uncle. Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. La ughni anka min Allahi shay'a. O Abbas, the son of Abdul Muttalib. Now of course everybody knows Abbas is his uncle. But he said, Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. To make, remind him, Abbas, you're the son of Abdul Muttalib the most noble person from the Quraysh. Doesn't matter who your father is, <laughs> on the Day of Judgment, I cannot save you. Right? That's why he used this title, Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. Everyone knows that this is the chief. Right? So Abbas, I can't help you, even though Abdul Muttalib is your father. Then he said, Ya Safiya ta amma ta Rasulillah. O Safiya, the aunt of Allah's messenger. Again, reminding her, you have a title. Your nephew is the messenger of Allah. But still, La ughni anki min Allahi shayya. I cannot help you with Allah in any way on the Day of Judgment. And then the third one he called out, Ya Fatima to bintu Muhammad. O Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad. Salini ma shi'ti min mali, la ughni anki min Allahi shayya. Whatever you want of my wealth, ask now, I can give you. But with Allah, when it comes to Allah on the Day of Judgment, I cannot help you in any way whatsoever. So what is the point of this hadith? When the Prophet ﷺ went to Mount Safa, called to each person with the titles, three different titles. Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, Safiya, Safiya Ammati Rasulillah, and Fatima bin Muhammad. Three different titles. Even if you're related to Muhammad ﷺ, there is no way he can save you on Yom al -Qiyam. You have to work for yourself. You have to believe in Allah and worship Allah to the best of your ability. So now it should strike us. If Muhammad ﷺ cannot help us go to Jannah, how can this peer or the guy in the grave, who is much lesser than Muhammad ﷺ, how can he help you? That's the idea. That the one who, is, who has maqam al-mahmud, 
The best of creation, best human being is Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We all of us know this. The number one human being is Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He has the highest position, al maqam al mahmud. He cannot even help his own aunt, his own daughter. Definitely not me and you, right? Who came 1400 years later? So if the best man from Bani Adam cannot help you go to Jannah, then anyone less than him can definitely not help you either. This is the concept. So this is how clear he was in his message. That you cannot take any human being and commit shirk with Allah using that human being. No, no, this guy's a holy man, he's going to help me go to Jannah. No. You will go to Jannah based on your own amal, your own deeds, your own actions, your own intentions. This is what's going to take you to Jannah. Right? So this is something that happens to a lot of people. Culturally speaking, someone may think, uh, let's give an example. Maybe uh, we're going somewhere, we're walking toward the street, and it happens because this is how you were culturally raised. Oh, the imam is with us, nothing's going to happen to us. No, this is shirk. <laughs> this is shirk. The imam is useless just like you. If Allah strikes us with something, we're all dead. <laughs> right? The imam can't stop it. But this is a cultural upbringing because of so much Sufism that was present, unfortunately. It's like in people's statements, they're not even realizing what's happening. So we have to clear ourselves in our statements, in our thinking, in our actions, that don't fall into this trap of shaitan. Right? Even the biggest scholar, he can't help you. He can explain the religion, now it's up to you to listen and follow it. But if you're not going to be able to help you. So this is the concept. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another ayah, He mentions to us that وَالَّذِينَ تَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِهِ مَا يَمْلِكُونَ مِن قِطْمِيرِ All these things that the human beings call upon besides Allah, whether it's the trees, the rocks, the sun, the moon, or other human beings, whoever it may be, whoever you call upon besides Allah, they do not even own a qitmir. And qitmir in Arabic is the thin membrane. When you eat the dates, if you take it off, there's a very thin membrane around the date stone. That's the qitmir. So Allah is saying in this ayah, such a small, thin little thing, they, didn't, they don't own this. Even this was created by Allah. So all these other things that you call upon, they didn't even create something small like a qitmir. They own nothing. They own nothing. Right? In tad'uhum la yasma'u du'a'akum. And once they have died, meaning passed away, and these other creations that you call upon, well, even when you call on them, la yasma'u du'a'akum. They do not hear your du'as. If someone is making du'a to the sun, the sun can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> the sun can't hear you. Or if you go to the grave and you're calling on this person, the dead man, help me. He can't hear you. So this is what Allah is saying. They cannot even hear your du'as. They can't. Let's say for the sake of argument, they can hear your du'a. Can they respond to you? No, they can't. So this is the third argument that Allah is giving. Let's say he, they can hear you. They have no power to respond because it is only Allah who gives things. And on the day of judgment, all these creations that people commit shirk with, they will come on Yawm Al-Qiyamah and say, I didn't tell this guy to worship me. I didn't tell him to make dua to me. Let's say those people who... Uh, you know, bring stones and are making dua to the stone. Did the stone ever tell the person, hey, make dua to me? No. <laughs> right? Or the guy who's in the grave. He never told someone, hey, make sure you worship me. He didn't. So all these things, or Isa never told Christians or his followers, call on me. So they'll all be brought on the Yom al Qiyamah and all of them will say, Yet furuna bi shirkiku. I reject the shirk you made. I didn't tell you to do this. You did this yourself. وَلَا يُنَبِّئُكَ مِثْلُ خبير. And this is the news that the all-knower uh, gives to you. And none of them can inform you except the all-knowing. So Allah gives you this news. So if you were to think, it, this is one of the most powerful verses in the Qur'an against shirk. 
like anyone, whether it's a Buddhist or Hindu or anybody that you go to and use this. Let's say this Buddha that you're s sitting in front of. Did he create even a, the membrane of a date stone? They'll say no. Can he hear you? They'll say no. Even if he can hear you, can he just give you something right now? No, he can't. So why are you worshipping it? So these are the arguments you should use. Just like Allah uses these arguments. Rather than, uh, of course, we know. It's hilarious that sometime would, some person would be foolish enough to go worship a cow or a monkey or this or that. It's foolish, we know. But at the same time, you have to be intelligent in how you give them the da'wah. Let them understand that, hey, you're making du'a to an elephant. Can this elephant hear what you're saying? No. Can he respond to you? No. Did he create anything? No. So why are you worshipping this elephant? Rather worship the one who created the elephant and created you, which is Allah. So these are the arguments you're supposed to uh, tell the mushrikun about. And then also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentioned, He asks rhetorical questions. That woman adallu mimman yad'u min dunillah. Who is more misguided than the one who makes dua to other things? Besides, that, who's more misguided? No one. The answer is no one. He's the most misguided person. The one who is making dua to something else and not Allah. مَنْ لَا يَسْتَجِيبُ لَهُ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ Even if he was to make dua from that moment all the way to the day of resurrection, that this thing will not be able to respond to him. If you cry on this th to this thing 24-7, every single day for the rest of your life, this being will not be able to respond to your dua. وَهُمْ عَنْ دُعَائِهِمْ غَافِلُونَ In fact, this thing doesn't even know that you're making dua to him. So you're only fooling yourself, the most uh, misguided person. Uh, so th this is how um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains to us that uh, shirk with people or any type of being that you exaggerate in praising, this is useless. It completely goes against all types of logic. It's absolute foolishness. And then one more ayah, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that قُلِ دُعُوا الَّذِينَ زَعَمْتُمْ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ لَا يَمْلِكُونَ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَلَا فِي الْأَرْضِ He's telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa go to the people and tell them all these things that you are worshipping, making dua to, right? You call on them, besides Allah, they do not even wait own an atom. What, uh, like uh, an atom's weight, okay? They don't even control an atom's weight in the heavens of the earth. Something so simple, the smallest thing that you can think of. They don't even own that. وَمَا لَهُمْ فِيهِمَا مِنْ شِرْكِ And nor do they have any share in creating that atom. They can maybe think, okay, they didn't create the whole atom, but they helped Allah create an atom. No, even something small like that, they did not help Allah in anything. وَمَا لَهُمْ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ ظَهِيرٍ Nor do they support Allah in creating this atom. They didn't help, they don't support, they have literally done nothing. وَلَا تَنْفَعُ شَفَاعَةُ إِنْدَهُ إِلَّا لِمَنْ أَذِنَ لَهُ And intercession. Because that's the other thing. This holy man will make shafa on my behalf to Allah. I am a sinner. I have to go through this holy person. So he's going to make shafa for me. But Allah is saying, "Wala tanfa'u shafa'atu indahu illa liman adina lahu." No one can make shafa with Allah except by His permission. Right? We're saying Ayatul Kursi. Everybody knows Ayatul Kursi. And what 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 are we saying in Ayatul Kursi? Man daladi yashfa'u indahu illa biizni. We're saying this in Ayat al-Kursi. No one can make shafa'ah without his permission. So meaning a person doesn't have the control. Right? That local peer has no control. Oh, don't worry. Come to me. I'll make shafa'ah for you. No. Allah has to give you permission. So it goes back to uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the one who owns uh, everything. Uh, he's the controller. And, and the possessor of all affairs. So there's no way you can turn to anyone. Because that's the other argument, even the Christian, let's say these Catholics or anybody. We are sinners, we go to our priest and our priest cleanses us. How do you know? No, no, he's going to intercede for us. 
Does he have any proof? Did, uh, is there any verse in the Bible that says, priest so and so, Allah has given him permission? No, there's no evidence for anything. So why are you turning to these people who are just like you? Uh, <clears throat> then also the other type of shirk. So we see clearly here that there is no way any human being or tree, rock, anything can ever help you with in sight of Allah. It's you and your deeds. Another common type of shirk that many people do, they believe in these good luck, bad luck, they hang things, they wear things, thinking that this is going to be good luck, bad luck. Okay, charms and amulets that they wear. Allah says in the Quran that ayushrikuna ma la yakhluqu shay'an wa hum yukhlaqun. Do they commit shirk with things that created nothing? In fact, they themselves are a creation. Right? And so let's say someone wears a neck uh, a bracelet. No, this or the best example the ta'wiz that people wear, right? They hang something around. No, no, this is going to protect me. Right? This is a creation. How can this creation protect you? Right? وَلَا يَسْتَطِيعُونَ لَهُمْ نَصْرًا وَلَا أَنفُسَهُمْ يُنصَرُونَ No help can these things give to them, nor can they even help themselves. Right? And then also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, وَإِنْ يَمْسَسْكَ اللَّهُ بِضُرٍ فَلَا كَاشِفَ لَهُ إِلَّا هُ If something harmful happens to you, Allah wills that a bad thing is going to happen to you. Who can save you except Allah? Let's say this bracelet uh, or the necklace you're wearing. Can this stop you from a car accident? Can this stop you from getting the flu? Can this stop you from failing in your exams? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so no. This cannot stop you from anything. If Allah wills bad for you, it will happen. وَإِن يُرِدِكَ بِخَيْرٍ فَلَا رَادَّ لِفَضْلِهِ and if Allah wills good for you, is there anyone or anything that can stop Allah from giving you His ni'mah, from His fadl? No. So whether it's evil or good, coming from Allah, nothing can stop Allah. Nothing. Right? So, يُسِيبُ بِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ And uh, the, the, the good that He cause, uh, wills for, to reach any of His slaves. So, وَهُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ He is the most forgiving, the most merciful. So there's nothing that these amulets, charms, uh, omens that people believe in and things that they wear, none of this can be uh, protecting against Allah's qadr. This is a hadith in the Musnad of Ahmed, Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu anhu. He said that uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi Islam was still new. So a person had just recently become Muslim. He came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi to give bayah. He took his shahada, now he's giving bayah to Rasulullah. So the Prophet ﷺ shook, grabbed his hand and saw that he was wearing a bracelet. So instantly he said, Ma hadihi? What's this that you're wearing? So qala, he said, Min al wahina. He said, I'm wearing this because I have weak bones. I have weakness. I'm old, I'm weak, so I wear this bracelet. So the Prophet ﷺ immediately said, Anzi'ha, in a command, take it off. Right? Now look at the, this is the same Prophet of Allah when a Bedouin came to urinate in the masjid and Umar wanted to cut his head off. He said, just leave him, leave him. He doesn't know. Right? He just became Muslim. He doesn't know that you're not supposed to urinate inside the masjid. So let him finish, okay, wash. And then he explained to the Bedouin, listen, this is a house of Allah. We don't urinate here, right? Because they're new Muslims, they don't know, right? We have to uh, apply this in Ramadan. <laughs> tell, tell people how to use the bathroom and don't break it. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> so, so he explained to the Bedouin with patience. He let him finish his business. But here you see that he did not, as he's shaking his hand, this is the first time he met him, and zi'ha, take it off. What's the difference between the two stories? One is uh, he don't know. The other one is already shaykh, uh, imam. He has already said he become Muslim already. No, both are Muslim. You're not getting it. No. What's the difference between the two stories? Both are by Muslims. Shaykh and not. Okay, there you go. Shaykh and not. The urination is not shirk, but this one is shirk. 
So the Prophet ﷺ did not delay. He immediately said, take it off. I'm not going to take your bayah until you take this off. So then he said to this person, فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَزِيدُكَ إِلَّا وَهْنَا this will benefit, this will do nothing for you except make you more weak. What did he mean? Your iman will be more weak. Instead of depending on Allah, you think a bracelet is helping you, your, your health. It's Allah who cures your health, not a bracelet that you hang around yourself. Right? So it only make you weaker, not help you. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, فَإِنَّكَ لَوْ مُتَّ وَهِيَ عَلَيْكَ مَا أَفْلَحْتَ أَبَدًا if you were to die and wearing this, you will never have success. What does it mean? You're not going to go to Jannah. So this was an issue of shirk. You cannot be patient. And that's why, because a lot of times people will come and say, no, it's okay. You know, he's still your Muslim brother. It's okay. We can talk about... No, he's falling into shirk. There's no time to waste. You have to explain it to him that this is shirk. Other things that you can be patient about. If a woman doesn't wear hijab, but at the same time, she's wearing bracelets and amulets and necklace thinking this will protect her. Majority of people will say, hey lady, cover up. This is wrong. Fix her iman first. That listen sister, what you're doing is shirk. If you die wearing a necklace thinking this is going to protect you, you're going to go to Jahannam. Alright, so you start with Tawheed first. Because if people don't understand Allah properly, they're not going to understand His laws. Right? Then also the Prophet ﷺ in another hadith in the Musnad of Ahmed was very direct. مَنْ تَعَلَّقَ تَمِيمَةً فَقَدْ أَشْرَكَ Whoever hangs a tamima, which is a general word for anything that you wear, whether on your hands or neck or feet, any, anything, or even hang on your house or anything, anything that you hang, thinking that it's going to protect you, that's a tamima. So whoever hangs a tamima, has indeed, فَقَدَ ashrak has indeed committed shirk. This is shirk, right? And what do, uh, again, you'll see in the Christian uh, uh, environment, they'll, they'll take a rabbit's foot, they hang it, a horseshoe, right? Uh, this is good luck. Like it's a rabbit's foot. You just cut a rabbit, you killed it, took cut a foot and hang it. How is this going to protect your house? Or it's a horseshoe, how is this going to protect your house? But likewise, many Muslims do the same thing. Many people coming from Muslim families, they believe in the same thing. They'll hang something. No, 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 it, it protects against evil. This is, a, if somebody takes a, you know, just throw it with a rod, it's, it's going to break. How is it going to protect you? Right? <laughs> so then, in another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, لا عد, In a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, لا عدوى ولا طيرة ولا هامة ولا صفر. And these were different things that the, Quran, the pagans used to believe in, superstition. That adwa, they think, contagious disease. Now what does this mean, even as, we have to remember this. Even if someone has a contagious disease, the disease in and of itself does not have the power to transfer from one body to another. Only if Allah wills, then it will happen. The best example I can give, let's say when you have flu. Some years, everyone in the house has flu. Other years, the father and mother has flu, the kids are fine. Even though we all know flu is contagious. Right? But it's Allah who gives the flu to spread. He allows the flu to spread. Otherwise, it's not going to spread. Okay? So this is what the Prophet ﷺ meant. La adwa. Because the Quraysh, they used to think that illness has the power to go by itself. This is what they used to believe. So that's what the Prophet ﷺ explained. That there is no adwa. Disease can only spread if Allah wills. But at the same time, you take your precautions, right? Uh, then also he said, وَلَا طِيَرَ طِيَرَ was the superstition that they used to believe, the Arab pagans, depending where the birds fly, if they are going to go out on a journey. Oh, I see this type of birds going in this direction. This is bad. I'm going to switch direction, go somewhere else. Right? So many superstitious things that people do. Like uh, I know in the Bengali Pakistani culture, if you're leaving your house and your shirt gets stuck on the door, oh no, this is bad luck. Let me come back inside the house, open the door, come back in, and then <laughs> just open the door, pull your shirt, and leave. Right? <laughs> but this is what people believe, subhanAllah, and this is shirk. 
You just say Bismillah tawakkaltu ala Allah wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. This is your dua for leaving the house. That's it. Allah will protect you. And if something bad happens, this was written for you. That's it. Right? And then wala hama. Hama again the pagan Arabs used to believe that if an owl at night time came and sat on their roof and was hooting, someone in that household was going to die because an owl came. In the Indian culture, it's a crow, right? <laughs> so, and, and the Muslims in Bangladesh, Pakistan, we adopted this from the Hindus. You know, no, there's nothing wrong with cats. <laughs> For one day he asked me if you can eat cats, and now he's asking if cats are evil. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you have to keep cats away from Zawin, he's obsessed. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course you'll die. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, so no, regardless of what kind of bird sits on the roof of your house, death will not come to that house except by the will of Allah, right? And the last thing, wala safar, the Quraysh, they used to think that the month of safar, is a very bad month to get married, uh, to get married. That if you get married in the month of Safar, this is bad sign. Don't, don't make these life decisions in this month, because it's bad. But month is a month, this is a time from Allah. Every day is the same, except you have Ramadan, best month of the year, Dhul Hijjah is coming up, the best days of the year. Other than that, everything is the same, right? But the month itself is not gonna say, if you get married here in this month, it's good. You'll never get divorced, or if you get married on that month, for sure you're going to be divorced. This is, you know, it's in Allah's hands. Yeah. Yeah, this is also unfortunately in our culture. So you see how many kinds of shirk is unfortunately widespread. Clear shirk, right? Uh, and the last thing, we'll, another type we'll talk about for tonight. Fortune telling and astrology. And this is also very common. Especially in these countries, every block has a palm reader, this, that, and they make lots of money. Gypsies, Gypsies you know. Uh, I went to, uh, I'm sure you guys have, uh, many of you might have the Indian channels. There's a guy in New York City. His name is Prem Jyotish. Right? You see his commercials. He, he, I mean, he's rich. That's why his commercial comes up like every 10 minutes. Like, call him. If you have problem with your jobs, this, that, oh, he'll fix everything for you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that وَمَا يُؤْمِنُوا أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ Most of humanity does not believe in Allah except by committing shirk. Their, their iman is corrupt. Most of the people are mushriks, right? So they go to these fortune tellers, this, that, and they want to know things. And the Prophet wasallam explained to us in a, in a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, like you have these people, uh, the palm reader, the card reader, uh, the crystal ball, whatever may be the case. Different things use different, uh, different people use different things. There was this, uh, when I was a kid, there was a Jamaican lady that used to call. Call me now, I see something, right? <laughs> but I don't know what happened to that lady. And it used to say $3 per minute, <laughs> right? So uh, she probably died out. Uh, you know, so all these things that different people have. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that um, in the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim that ida qad Allahu fi sama. Whenever Allah makes a decree, right? Darabat al malaika tu bi ajnihatiha khud'anan li qawlihi. When Allah is speaking that this year, and we know Laylatul Qadr, right? Uh, what happens in Laylatul Qadr? For the next one year, Allah gives the Qadr to the angels. Like, Allah already knows, but He's informing the angels what's going to happen, right? So when Allah is giving His Qadr, this, uh, His decree, the angels, out of fear of Allah's speech and humility, they beat their wings in submission. They're in a state of sujood, and they're listening to Allah from fear and, 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 and humility, and they're beating their wings, it's in submission, alright? The sound that the wings of the angels make, it's like as if you were to drag chains on top of rocks. When you do that, that will be the sound of all these billions and billions of angels fluttering their wings. Uh, so, th and this is what happens. So then, 
فَإِذَا خُزِّعَ عَنْ قُلُوبِهِمْ قَالُوا When that fear, Allah removes the fear from their hearts, finally they can speak to Allah. مَاذَا قَالَ رَبُّكُمْ I mean, they're speaking to each other, sorry. What did your Lord say? They're so scared and in such submission, they're not even thinking of listening to Allah. They're just beating their wings out of fear and humbleness. These are the angels. But then of course Jibreel comes and tells because Jibreel is the one who hears it first. But these other angels, everyone else, they're beating their wings out of submission to Allah. So then once that fear is removed by Allah, they ask each other, what did your Lord just say? What's the decree? قَالُوا الْحَقَّ وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْكَبِيرُ So they say to each other, whatever he said is the truth, and he is the most high, uh, the most great. And this is the ayah from the Qur'an as well. <laughs> then anyways, فَيَسْمَعُهَا مُسْتَرِقُ السَّمْعِ And this is what used to happen. The jinns, the shayateen, and I had mentioned this, we start, by the way, those of you who aren't here, Last Saturday I started a whole series on jinn, magic and all this at EHT. So I'm going to continue this this Saturday as well, inshallah. So I had mentioned this incident, that the jinns, the devils, they stand on one another. So one shaitan will stand on his shoulders, another shaitan and so on and so forth. They reach to the skies and they try to listen in. What is Allah saying to the angels? What's going to happen for this year, right? So, فَيَسْمَعُهَا مُسْتَرِقُ السَّمْعِ وَمُسْتَرِقُ السَّمْعِ هَكَذَا بَعْدُهُ فَوْقَ بَعْدُ So the Prophet ﷺ showed the Sahaba with his fingers that they are standing on top of one another until they reach the skies. فَيَسْمَعُ الْكَلِمَةَ فَيُلْقِيهَا إِلَى مَنْ تَحْتَهَا So when the one at the top is able to, by Allah's permission, hear something, he then says it to the one at the bottom, then at the bottom, then at the bottom, and it comes back down. To the one who's standing on the ground in this, in this dunya. حَتَّى يُلْقِيهَا عَلَى لِسَانِهِ السَّاحِرِ لِسَانِ السَّاحِرِ أَوِ الْكَاهِرِ And this one who's on the ground is the one who then talks to the sahir, meaning the magician, the fortune teller, uh, says, because they use shayateen, they use jinns. And then they say uh, what they heard, all right? So this is how the fortune teller fools somebody. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, فَرُبَّمَا أَدْرَكَ شِهَابُ قَبْلَ أَنْ يُلْقِيهَا Sometimes, by the will of Allah, before they can listen, the angels catch them, and they throw the star to kill them. That's the shooting star that you see. So again, it's a shirk. Christians say, when you see a shooting star, make a wish. No. Say, Alhamdulillah, the angels are killing devils. Right? This is what the shooting star is. Uh, uh, um, they, the angels, they grab the stars and they shoot it at the devils to prevent them from hearing and they kill them this way. Uh, and sometimes they are able to hear one or two things, but this is a shaitan. With that one thing that he heard from the conversation between the angels, he'll mix with it a hundred lies because he's a shaitan. Shaitan lie, right? This is their attribute. So they'll say one true, but a hundred lies. This is what the jinn does. So the jinn now tells the fortune teller that the guy who came, please tell me I need this and that, whatever it is, what's going to happen to me two years down the road. So then, uh, so then this person tells to the customer, oh, such and such will happen. So just like the shaitan, he'll say one good thing and with a hundred lies. And then this person leaves. Uh, and then, فَيُقَالُوا أَلَيْسَ قَدْ قَالَ لَنَا يَوْمَ كَذَا وَكَذَا كَذَا وَكَذَا The people will then say, the customer, when he leaves the fortune teller, maybe years passed by, so many things the fortune teller said, nothing happened. But then five years later, that one thing out of the hundred statements came out true, and then the, hey, that kahin told us such and such was going to happen that day. Do you remember? And then, فَيُصَدَّقُوا بِتِلْكَ الْكَلِمَةِ الَّتِي سُمِعَتْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ So this is what the magician is said, so the people will then say, those who have no iman, that, man, that, that person knows the future. Right? For, I mean, he won't think to listen that for the past five years the person was wrong. Now finally one thing came right. But then this is the, unfortunately, the weakness of iman. People who don't have tawheed fall into this. But what did the Prophet ﷺ say for us Muslims? So he explained to us how this thing works. So the fortune teller, card reader, whatever may be the case, 
they communicate with the jinns and the jinns will give this information so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in a hadith in sahih muslim man ata arrafan fasaluhu an shay'in lam taqbalu lahu salatu 40 yawma whoever goes to one of these people asks him even one question his salah will not be accepted by allah for 40 days this is the punishment for just asking a question. Just asking. Alright? You have to pray, but your punishment is for 40 days, none of your salah will be accepted. Just by asking. And in a hadith in Abu Dawood, the Prophet ﷺ said, Man ata kahinan, fasaddaqahu bima yaqul. Whoever goes to these people and believes, the first hadith says, asking even one question. The second hadith is saying that you end up believing what this fortune teller is saying. فَقَدْ كَفَرَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ If you believe even in one thing, then you have disbelieved in what was sent down to Muhammad, which is what? The Qur'an. Meaning you're a kafir. You have disbelieved in the Qur'an if you believe the kafir. Now, maybe someone doesn't want to waste his money, go to a palm reader, or the crystal ball, or whatever may be the case. But this is the same thing as the zodiac signs. And this is free. You go to yahoo.com, you're reading news, but on the side there says your daily zodiac or daily horoscope. Do not click on it. Because when you click on it, you have read and you have asked one question. You're not supposed to do this. Or let's say when you go to a Chinese restaurant, they give you a fortune cookie. You want to eat the cookie? No problem. But don't read the fortune from some China, Confucius, a follower of some, you know, which is a very confusing religion. <laughs> Confucianism is a very confusing religion. So uh, don't read anything. Just eat the cookie. Because if you read, that means you have asked, you have inquired, you have sought some information. So this shirk, unfortunately, is widespread. Even in Muslim countries, there are many Muslim countries, subhanAllah, I've seen it with my own eyes. On their newspapers, when they used to have newspaper, they'll give the daily horoscope. I mean, subhanAllah. Right? Oh, they still do it. Okay. So this is something that we have to avoid. This is shirk. How do stars, like you were born in this month, this is the star sign, this is what's going to happen to you. So the star is not Allah. It's Allah who gives your qadr. Not the star. It's just, uh, who cares if you're a Libra or a Taurus or this or that? Who cares? what month you're born, right? So this is something that you have to be very careful. Now, uh, just so you know the difference, Araf in Arabic is for someone who tells you about the past. All right, so let's say you go to somebody, and this is very common. If you look in the villages, in certain countries, if you lose something, they go to an Araf. I have lost a valuable thing, can you tell me where it was? You know the ghaib, this is shirk. He knows your past. How does he know your past? Again, I had mentioned this on Saturday's lecture. The day we are born, Allah assigns a qareen to us. This is the hadith in Sahih Muslim. This is the shaitan jinn. This jinn stays with us from the day we are born. He knows exactly what you did, on what day, at what time, where. What does this araf do? He talks to your qareen. And the Qareen gives, you in, gives the Arraf the information. Oh yeah, two weeks ago on a Tuesday at 12 p.m. He went to his uncle's house and he lost his wallet under the chair. This Arraf then tells you exactly where it is. <gasps> oh my God, what just happened, right? But the, this, is a, this person gets the information from your Qareen. So whether you go to an Arraf, meaning someone who tells you about your past, Kahin is someone who claims he knows the future. This is the difference, okay? So Arraf tells about the past, Kahin tells about the future. But the Prophet ﷺ mentioned both. Whether you go to an Arraf or Kahin doesn't matter. Past, present, future doesn't matter. Okay? And also uh, the numerology, this is what the Hindus do a lot, the numerology. Uh, this is Abajad, this is the Arabi term for it, as Abdullah ibn Abbas mentioned. So all of this, any type of fortune telling, and there's different kinds, all of them is shirk. To ask even one question, your salah is rejected for 40 days. And Allah forbid if you believe in it, even one thing, then you have disbelieved in the Qur'an. You, you know, you have to renew your iman, literally. Right? Uh, this is kufrul akbar. Because you're believing that this human being knows the ghayb. 
It's only Allah who has the knowledge of the ghayb, right? Uh, this is what kind of shirk? You're literally giving rububiyyah to someone else, right? Uh, so inshallah ta'ala, we'll stop here for tonight. We have uh, 25 minutes for Q&A until we pray Isha. Uh, the sisters, as usual, send down your questions. Yes, brother. Yes, sometimes they like hanging like charms in the car. Yeah. Yeah, so the same thing, don't hang things in your car. Uh, it's not going to protect, right? So let's suppose if you buy a new car, you want to protect it from the evil eye. Uh, you, you know, of course, you buy it with Allah's name, uh, recite on yourself, whatever it is, and that's it. Anyone who sees a new car, even if they don't say, MashaAllah, Allahumma barik uh, lak, you know, barakallahu feek, they don't make the dua for the barakah, you make it on yourself, you know? That Allah give me barakah in, in my new car, whatever it is. This is how you protect it. Hanging things does not protect anything, right? And we had mentioned also from the sunnah, uh, now a question can come, can you hang Qur'an? Okay, we understand the ta'weez and this and that, this is all shirk, right? But what about Qur'an? Hanging Qur'an is a bid'ah. Qur'an is for recitation. That's what the word Qur'an means. The Qur'an meaning the oft, most recited thing. Right? This is what the word Qur'an means. It's for qara, to read. You read the Qur'an for your protection. So we have from the Sunnah, reading Fatiha, Ikhlas, Falak Nas, Ayatul Kursi, these protect you from evil. This is from the Sunnah. So that's what you do. You read on yourself, not hang it. Okay? This is a bid'ah. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was asked this question that this is something uh, that the Sahaba used to hate. How dare you take the Qur'an for something hanging? Well, this is not a decoration or you recite, you memorize, you understand, you implement in your life. That's what the Qur'an is for, right? So uh, because Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, when he was stationed in Kufa, he had noticed some people were doing this and he shunned them. He's like, I mean, the Sahaba of Rasulullah are still alive and you're introducing this bid'ah. That's basically what he said. Um, Can you buy a charm bracelet just to wear, not for the good luck? This, is, uh, this goes against the perfection of Tawheed. That let's suppose you know something is used as an object of shirk by other people. You as a muwahid should not use this. Alright? You already know that this is an object of shirk. Like for example, it's the same thing. The Christians believe in charm bracelets and things like that. Hindus have the idols of Ganesh and Hanuman and this and that. Are you going to bring Hanuman to your house? No Muslim will say yes. It is the same thing. Why don't you bring Hanuman? Because we know this is an object of worship by the Hindus. So these charm bracelets are an object of worship by the Christians. It's the same thing. So you as a Muslim, even though you're not committing shirk, but this goes against the perfection of shirk, uh, tawheed, that you are wearing something that is clearly defined. The whole, everybody knows. The norm of society is that they believe in this type of shirk by wearing this. So you should not wear uh, these bracelets. But of course, any type of other bracelets your parents give or uh, your husband gives, whatever it may be, you know, gold, diamond, this is all fine. There's bracelets, bra halal bracelets of so many kinds. Wear those, right? No need to just focus on the one shirk bracelet. <laughs> right? Yes, brother. Alaikum salam. Uh, there are two types of charm bracelets out there. One is the one you mentioned. And the other is just purely for, uh, for uh, uh, beauty. Yeah. Charm themselves, they, they, they call charm bracelets because you can add those little trinkets to it. Yeah. So those trinkets are not for... Uh, yeah, no, those are fine. So, Jazakallah uh, khair. So, uh, I don't think they were me up Okay, so the charm... Now, uh, because the charms, when we say this word in English, in Arabic, this is tia, which is omens, right? So if it's those designated bracelets of omens, then of course you don't uh, wear them. But there are these other bracelets, they call it charm bracelets. Uh, uh, I, I don't even know all these things, but okay, all right. So, I'm good. <laughs> so, uh, so if it's those bracelets where you're putting those beads and making it longer, and longer is that well, that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, of course, those, those are just for beauty, whatever may be the case. But again, as I said, that it has to be clear. If it's something specifically, that it's for the good luck or bad luck, or you know that this design, uh, because I don't follow up with, I don't have the time, alhamdulillah, to follow up with the fashion trends, 
So if you know this specific design is the in thing to mean that this is good luck or bad luck, then you have to avoid that specific design. That's the whole point, okay? Uh, and if you can avoid that, then that's best. Yes, Talha. How does the board of access to the Did you just come? Yeah, I know. Oh, oh, you were here. I know, but like, how do they like, know that? Like, well, how do they get access? Yeah. Uh, because this is a, this is, all these fortune telling this, that the general term for this is sihr, which is magic, okay? So when someone becomes a fortune teller, whatever may be the case, uh, and may Allah protect all of you young people from ever thinking this and all of us, they literally have to contact, they have to uh, sell their souls to the devils, and then a shaitan comes and, and, and works with them. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So the shaitan will do certain things, or tell a person, they're all around us. If you're thinking evil, the evil idea or the means comes right in front of you. So if someone is looking to communicate with the devils, then there's obviously many ways that they do it, and then it's uh, something that they basically kill themselves and they kill their iman with. Is it okay to keep pictures hidden somewhere just to have it for memories? Uh, what you can do... Be, uh, Maybe, well, this, this is a lecture in and of itself, the ruling on pictures and things like that. But briefly, what's haram is to print the pictures unless there is need. Like, for example, medical need. All right, printing pictures for these type of reasons is completely fine. Digital images is different. If you take a picture on your phone or compu and you store it, you're not printing it, you keep it, this is fine. But at the same time, it's not safe. You can lose your phone, people can hack into your phone, especially if you're a sister, maybe you took pictures without hijab, someone steals your phone, someone hacks into your machine, then they can see these pictures, all right? Uh, sometimes you can misplace it, uh, and it happens all the time. So this is not something that you should carelessly go about. Let's say you went somewhere with your family, you took a picture on your cell phone, quickly come home, move it away from your phone and keep it in a hard drive in your house, whatever may be the case, if you want to keep it in that type of memory. So digital pictures is not haram. You're just capturing light image. What's haram is printing it, hanging it in your house and things like that. That's haram. All right? The angels do not enter any house, as the hadith in Sahih Muslim says, angels do not enter any house where there are dogs or pictures hanging. Okay, so don't hang your pictures. You keep them stored in your uh, computer, whatever may be the case, that's fine. I have a calendar picture. Calendar yeah, any type of picture, don't hang them in your house. I have an old day, people wedding, they make the picture and they put it out and they keep it in an album. Yeah, album, yeah. No, no, no. The concept of printing is what's haram. Unless there is a need, which is, as I said, medical issues, identification, legal issue. Let's say police are looking for a criminal. Now they have a picture of them. Print out the picture, put it on everywhere. This is for a legal issue. Okay, so these type of necessities is fine. What, what's the darura that I have to print my grandfather's picture and keep it in an album? It's not a matter of life and death. It has nothing. So this is just your desires. So this is what is wrong, that you're not supposed to uh, print. And if you have, as Brother Minhaj was saying, let's suppose you have a calendar or something. It's not you who did it, but someone somewhere else. What you can do is just blotch out, take a pen, just cross out the eyes in the picture, completely fine. All right? This, then that's fine. So you cannot keep it even in the album? No, no. So that's not something that you do. You cannot keep it in the album? Is there any strict order regarding the picture? Yeah, this is the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. That's why I was saying that this issue of pictures is a whole lecture of itself. But the, the Prophet wasallam said that the one who draws pictures... He is competing with Al-Musawwir. Al-Musawwir is one of Allah's names, the one who fashions his creation. So you are drawing what Allah has already drawn. Who gave you the right to compete with Allah? So we are not allowed, because that I have to be clear, pictures of humans and animals, meaning anything with a soul. This is what's haram. Anything with a living soul, you cannot have those pictures. Right? Uh, if you want to print pictures of mountains, trees, all this stuff, that's fine. These are not, these things don't have a living soul. So only animals and human beings. This is the restriction. And this is a, a, a huge sin, right? And then on the day of judgment, 
those people who used to draw pictures, Allah will call them, as the hadith continues. He said, you competed with me in the dunya, give them life. The pictures you drew, give them life. And of course, the artists won't be able to give life, and Allah will grab them and put them in Jahannam. So this is a competition with al-musawwir. So this is why you don't draw uh, the images. So someone can say, well, I'm not drawing. You're pressing a button, and the printer is drawing for you. This is what the printer is doing. It's a machine drawing the image, all right? And you press print. <laughs> so you're the one who's drawing it. So you cannot print pictures unless it's for these needs. Medical purpose, ID, this is fine. Right? Um, so if I have an album of pictures, do I have to destroy all the memories? Memories are in your brain. I'm sure you do not have a picture of your grandparents. If someone, if the sister is in her 50s. How do you remember your grandparents? This is a... You, how do you remember Rasulullah? How do you remember all these Anbiya? The stories are the memories. And that's the best kind of memories, where you really love someone and you remember their life. And you pass on to their life, their biographies. Many times people have a picture, even myself. You know, there were pictures my mom showed me of her uncle. I don't know anything about the guy. <laughs> but but I, there's a picture. Somewhere. Yeah, no, you, 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 you dis discard them, you know, yeah, you discard them, so use the modern technology, yeah. from now on if you and your wife go somewhere on a romantic date, you want to take a picture of yourselves, keep it in your computer, no problem, right, <laughs> but the old albums you have, destroy them, <laughs> yeah. so that, that's fine, inshallah, so you want, that's why you got Okay, so this is a related question. If I have some photographs of my family hanging on the wall, is this okay? Uh, this is not okay because the angels do not enter any house where pictures are hanging uh, on the walls or somewhere. Um, let's see. Okay, this is one second. You kids mixed up the questions that I'll be read. <laughs> okay, many people use incense sticks to keep ghosts away, but can I just use incense for the scents? <laughs> uh, first of all, there's no such thing as ghosts. Once you die, you're dead. Dead people don't come back. Dead people don't come back to haunt you. If dead people came back, the only thing they'll tell you is, believe in la ilaha illallah. All right, they're not going to haunt you. They'll tell you to believe in Allah. Let me finish this question. So that's one thing. So there's nothing called ghosts. Uh, and also the incense burners. The concept, uh, again, we'll <coughs> mention this, inshallah, on the Saturday EHT series, since we're talking about jinns and things there. Uh, the, the concept is if your house smells nice and is clean, this is a house where angels like to come. And that's what you want as a Muslim. Keep your house clean, looking nice, smelling nice. Uh, you know, no pictures, no dogs inside the house. You want the malaika to come to your house. But if it's the opposite, there are pictures, there are dogs. It's filthy, it smells bad, it looks bad. Then you're opening the door for shayateen. Alright, so there's no specific evidence saying incense bur burner keeps away the shayateen. It, but the concept, I hope you understand, sister, it comes from a hadith, yes, that you keep your house smelling nice, looking nice. So the angels come, right? So if, of course, incense burners, uh, bakhur, these type of things uh, have some, you know, I'll say some because I don't like all of their smell, uh, but many people like all kinds of bakhur. So, this is about the angels. This is about the angels. This is about the angels. Came out what? Oh, came our house? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, that's of course, that's shirk. Yeah, that would be shirk. So the point is that you keep your house smelling nice with whatever it is, perfumes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so this will how it, uh, you would, so if incense burners have good smell and the, your niya is to make your house smell nice, uh, things like that, that's completely fine. Yeah, yeah, brother. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, dolls are fine. Yeah, dolls are fine. Okay, Barbie is not the best doll you should give to your daughters because Barbie teaches girls to grow up and dress half naked and be rebellious to their parents and go find boyfriend named Ken. Right? <laughs> so, uh, buy uh, dolls that teach moral values, which is a hadith in Sahih Muslim. Aisha uh, radiallahu anha, they used to make dolls of horses, all right, or babies, because as the scholars mentioned, uh, like you have those dolls where you're even feeding, it makes burping noise, you, it, uh, you add water, it leaks, change diaper, this, that. These are good dolls to buy for your daughters because it teaches them motherhood in the future. All right, this is how you develop their minds. Let them play, let them learn how to play their key role in society. All right, so these, these dolls are completely fine, no problem. This is a hadith in Sahih Muslim. Even the Sahabiyat, as Aisha radiallahu anha, and the Prophet Islam did not stop them. Right? So these are toys and stuff, that's fine. Right? But of course, after you're done playing, clean up the house. Right? Don't just <laughs> leave them lying around. Uh, okay, we got a couple of very important questions. Uh, okay, I heard that the Prophet Islam said that any person with an Adam's worth of Tawheed will be saved from the fire. Does this count as any type of Muslim? Yes, this is a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. Uh, the one who has Tawheed, Iman, uh, even the weight of an Adam, that this is what we had mentioned last week. That the only way you can go to paradise, even if you fell into sin, that you get punished in Jahannam for only Allah knows how long. But it's only the person of Tawheed who will eventually come out of Jahannam and go to Jannah. All right, so, but the condition is you have to have Tawheed. Now, what does that mean that he has an atom's weight of Tawheed? He, he never committed shirk. His Iman was weak, that's why he fell into drinking, zina, this, that. But a person of Tawheed with strong level of Iman, of course, he avoids these major sins. All right, so that's the meaning uh, of the Hadith. The person has Tawheed, but he was very weak. That's why he fell into all these sins. And he's being punished in Jahannam, but eventually he'll be taken out, even if he had that Adam's weight of Tawheed. Right? Um, clarification? Yes. Oh, okay. The question asked will be saved from the fire. Uh, so. Well, hopefully the questioner understood the answer because that's what the hadith says. Uh, 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 even if you were to be saved from the fire, meaning you will not be in Jahannam abadan forever. Okay, you'll be saved from for being in the fire forever. Okay, eternal fire you're saved from if you have tawheed. Just a few short ones. Jahannam is oh no, no. Dunya is a longer one. For, uh, just to, for example. How long dunya can just to little bit? <laughs> what did you just ask? One year is a Jahannam, how many minutes or how many hours? Oh, we, we have no idea. Never given that many minutes, nothing at all, anyway? No. Uh, there's no Sahih hadith mentioning that. Uh, but we have in the Quran, in Surah Ma'arij, yeah. Allah mentioned Yawmul Qiyamah, yeah. uh, the day. Of Yom Al Qiyamah is equal to 50,000 years of our time. That's Yom Al Qiyamah. That's how long the day of Yom Al Qiyamah is. Okay? So I can tell you that because that's in the Quran. But as, as far as how long is the day in Jahannam, Allahu Akbar. Right? Yeah, go ahead. You have your hand raised for a moment. Yes. Okay, so one is uh, so you said that um, like doing the like uh, zodiac signs in like online is haram. But what if you is like for example, like last year I have a uh, classwork project which I have to uh, like see what my zodiac sign was. Is that wrong because I did that? If you actually tell your see, this is one thing, kids, you need to learn. It's your religious right. If something in school violates your religion, you have every freedom to tell the teacher that I just can't do this. Give me an alternative. They 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 have to listen. All right, this is uh, the First Amendment. So don't feel shy, just tell them. But this is something that happened last year, you didn't know, but now you know, so inshallah, uh, if this situation happens, you know what to do. Yes, please. Sometimes you're wearing like t-shirt or shirt, they have like monogram like that, anyone you know. Yeah. So you just allow to wear that. Yeah, the faces and stuff. 
this is not something that you can make like what is this a boat or the Ralph Lauren t-shirt yeah okay this is a leaf okay fine but what I'm saying is sometimes yeah those let's say Ralph Lauren you, you cannot it, it looks like the shape of a person playing polo on a horse yeah but you cannot make out the face that's different it's just the image you can't see the face clearly right so that, that's that's different that's fine what is wrong is you shouldn't wear t-shirts that clearly you can see the face, all right? All right, hold on. We, we, uh, let me just answer the sister's questions. <clears throat> is it possible that Buddha is among the unknown prophets? Uh, I think she, uh, she's referring to Gotham Buddha. Uh, I know there are uh, records of him. Like if you act even, uh, <clears throat> and I actually learned this even when I took philosophy class. Uh, this Gautam never actually, he, he was an outcast of course from India, but he never said go worship different gods. He believed in one god, but this is something that I, I, we can't say that if, if uh, he was one of the prophets or not. But we, we know that Allah, and I mentioned this ayah last week, that to every nation he sent a prophet and a messenger proclaiming the message of Tawheed. All right? We leave it to Allah. This is not something that I believe or disbelieve. Okay, so don't say, oh yes for sure, or no, not for sure. But <coughs> the case is, this is Allah Ala. Okay, now there are some questions related. It's, uh, <coughs> all right, so Jesus was a non-violent reformer while Muhammad wasalam, fought in wars. Why is there a difference between Jesus and Muhammad in terms of their approach? Uh, it, that's not true. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm trying to get to. Now, the approach both of them had was exactly the same. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ did not go raid villages and towns and attack them uh, for any unknown reason. Let's suppose he came with the message of La ilaha illallah, just like Jesus came with. And we know that <clears throat> the Israelites at that time, the leaders among the Jews, they wanted to kill Isa. <laughs> Uh, similarly, the pagans wanted to kill the Prophet ﷺ, wanted to kill the Muslims, they attacked, uh, they raided the Muslim places, threw them out of their homes and this and that. So in any type of war situation, when a group of, when an army is attacking you, you're not just going to stand there and say, okay, you know what, kill us, rape us, do whatever you want. Right? So, because Islam is a whole, hey kids, uh, Islam is a whole system of life. All right, it's a way of life. Likewise, part of life, whether we like it or not, every now and then, <clears throat> some evil people start wars. Innocent people just can't be bystanders and say, you know, okay, fine, attack us, kill us. Allah gave us rulings that if you are attacked, you do have the ability, I mean, you have the right to stand up and defend yourself, fight against your oppressors. But unlike other religions, because you have verses in the Bible, like in, uh, in Samuel chapter 15, for some reason the God of Israel is saying, go to the village, kill women, children, ox, sheep. I mean, don't leave anything behind. It's a verse in the Bible. Kill even animals and children. What did donkeys do to the Jews? Nothing, right? But they say, kill the donkeys and sheep too, right? So kill everything. And that is exact, a lot of people don't know this. This is exactly what the Christians do to this day. They're following their Bible. Because the Bible says when you go attack, destroy everything. That is what they still do. They drop bombs from 500 miles away that destroy everything in sight. So when a Christian tells you, you Muslims are terrorists, remind them of their religion. We're not the ones who make up stuff. You're the one who's actually following your Bible and destroying everything. Rather, Islam, when there is a war, it is very restricted. It is soldier versus soldier. Allah has made it forbidden that to kill a woman, to kill a child, you cannot even go destroy trees in wartime. These are the restrictions Allah put forth on Muslim soldiers. You don't even go destroy trees. Just the soldier who has the weapon and is attacking you. That's it. No non-combatants can be killed. So the war situation or the rules of war in Islam is extremely restricted. 
and only based on dire needs of self-defense. So uh, this is very different from the warfare that the Christians and Jews believe in from the Old Testament. Uh, the next question is, uh, why does the Quran talk more about Jesus than Muhammad? So this is again, uh, also in the Quran, the, the prophet that is mentioned the most, sister, is Musa, Moses. The story of the children of Israel is mentioned the most because of the similarities that Muslims today have with the Jews to give us lessons. Don't turn your backs on the prophets, on your back, turn your backs on Allah like the Jews did with Musa alayhi salam. The story of Isa alayhi salam is mentioned more and this should be a miracle in and of itself because this is information that the Christians were confused about. Like let's say uh, Isa alayhi salam being born uh, of a miraculous birth and him speaking from the cradle. There is not a single verse in the Bible that says Jesus spoke from the cradle. Not even one verse in the Bible. But Allah mentioned this in Surah Ali Imran and in Surah Maryam. So we have the verse, a direct textual evidence that says Isa salam spoke from the cradle. Right? So this is information for the Christians that if you truly want to learn about Isa salam, Jesus, you truly want to learn about your Creator, then read this book. This is where the information is without any confusion, without any doubts, and so on and so forth. So this is from the wisdom of Allah because He knows people have taken Jesus as His Son, other people deny Him, most people don't believe in Him the proper way, so that's why Allah mentioned His story more, to clarify this concept so humanity can understand who Jesus really was properly. And also the fact that Jesus, He is one of the Ulul Azam, this is a term for five great messengers, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Ibrahim, Nuh alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, and Isa alayhi salam. These five are the top messengers from God. All right, so that's why their stories are mentioned more than others. Um, the last question from the sister, what good is free will if everything is predetermined? If God already knows uh, if we are going to heaven or hell, why does, it just, uh, why does he just put us there? Well, uh, the difference is that obviously our knowledge is limited, Allah's knowledge is infinite. He is Al-Ali, meaning the most knowing, the all-knowing, and we are the slaves of all-knowing. Allah cannot learn something as every day goes by. We humans learn things about life, about our surroundings, about ourselves as every day goes by. But Allah, He's the Creator, He already knows everything. Let's say free will. Allah knows what you're going to do, but you don't know that. Because He is your Lord who created you, He knows ins and out of you. Like for example, when we people from the blessing of their mind that Allah gave them the intelligence, they build cars. The car manufacturer gives you an owner's manual of four or five hundred pages, tells you exactly when you should change the oil, how long the tires should run, this, that. Why does the, they know well, how do they know this because they built this product they know how the, long this will last when you have when it will get sick how to take care of it so on and so forth so we see this in our daily life if a human being can do this with something he I don't want to use the word created but let's just say for the sake of the argument something that he created by the uh, mercy of Allah then of course God who created everything he knows exactly what's gonna happen when you need servicing, when your tires need to be changed, when you got to feed yourself, what food is going to make you sick, what food is going to be healthy for you, so on and so forth. All right? So the Creator will definitely know. That's one. Number two, Allah knows everything, but we don't know. We can't use this as an excuse. How do you know for a fact that you are written for Jahannam? That's the trick from the devil. No one, no, none of us sitting here has a paper from Allah saying, you are in Jahannam. None of us. You know, could we? Yes. Do we want to? No, of course not. That's why we try hard to be good Muslims. Because we don't know. We don't have any evidence from God that He's in the fire or me or this and that. We are all uh, ignorant about this fact. So we have to strive hard. Otherwise, life would become meaningless. So free will, Allah gives you free choice. You have the choice. Absolute choice. 
to worship Allah or to worship something else. No one is forcing you to do anything or not worship at all. So this is the free will and free choice that Allah gives. Even though He knows, because He's the Creator, of which person, what's in their hearts, He knows. He can hear everything, what people are thinking, what people are feeling. So that's the thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knows. He is the all-knowing. But a person doesn't know this. So he cannot use predestination as an excuse. We can argue, what's the proof that you're not going to Jannah? So why don't you work hard to go to Jannah? Right? So it's the devil's trick. Like, listen, everything's predetermined. There's no point trying. Just, you know, forget life. Just kill yourself. <laughs> right? <laughs> so this is what happens. This is the trick from the devil. Because the devil is the one who has been cursed through eternity. He will be in the hellfire through eternity. So the devil will play all sorts of tricks. And this is mentioned clearly in the Quran. He plays all sorts of tricks to confuse you. So you can end up with him in eternal hellfire. And this is one of the biggest doubts that the shaitan brings in people's minds. So as the people will stop trying, right? Same thing. You can eat a lobster and a steak and all that. But guess what? When you wake up after this beautiful dinner, you're going to be hungry for breakfast. So why do you eat? What's the point of eating? I'm going to be hungry. It's very foolish. No one thinks this way. But the devil makes you think this way about religion. So Allah gives us examples in everyday life. You cannot think this way. It's, it's foolish to think this way. So since we don't know our future, we work our level best and we leave it to Allah. And if our hearts are clean, then surely Allah will reward us with paradise. So inshallah ta'ala give that then and then we'll pray. Uh, inshallah. <coughs>